In the springtime, we remember the promised land is not a destination. It is a way of going. The land beyond the Jordan, that country of freedom and dignity and laughter, you carry it inside you. It is planted in your mind and heart already before you ever start out. We're in the middle of the eight-day-long Jewish holiday of Pesach, or Passover. It began Monday night, and it will end on Tuesday when the sun goes down. And as many of you know already, especially if you were here to celebrate last night, and celebrate we did, Passover is the holiday that celebrates the exodus the movement out of enslavement of the ancient Jewish people before they had become the Jewish people and were called the Israelites. The story of the Exodus is told in the second book of the Hebrew Bible, aptly named Exodus. (laughs) It was written down sometime in the sixth century before Common Era when the Jewish people were once again in exile, that time in Babylon. The story of the original Exodus, the one written down, takes place about seven centuries before. So we can imagine that those sixth-century exiles wanted to capture the story of their beginnings and to tell that story in a way that would give them strength to endure what they were currently experiencing, to help them remember their identity as an exodus people, their belief that they had experienced all of this before and that God had brought them through it. It's important to say what might be obvious, uh, that the story most likely didn't happen the way it is told in the book of Exodus, and that biblical scholars differ wildly in how much of it they believe is historical. But there is evidence to suggest that it is certainly possible that a version of the story actually did happen. The story begins after the Israelites had migrated from their homeland in Canaan due to a famine and settled in Egypt. And after many generations, the book of Exodus tells us that the Israelites had become a numerous and prosperous people. And around the time of the 19th dynasty, somewhere around 1300 to 1250 BCE, a new pharaoh, it's unclear who, but maybe Seti I or Ramses II, had come to power in Egypt and he viewed this group of once refugees with their own culture and traditions as a threat to his power a very old story indeed. So he enslaved the Israelites and forced them to build his expanding cities. And this goes on for a long time, several hundred years by some reckonings until a leader named Moses is born. Now Moses is a superhero in Jewish history And so he is given a hero's birth story. The story says he was born just as the Pharaoh had decreed that the male children of Israelite women need to be killed in order to reduce the population. But Moses' mother can't do it. And she hides him and floats him down the river in a basket. And he's found by none other than the daughter of the pharaoh, who happens to be taking a walk on the banks of the river just at the right time. And uh, the daughter of the pharaoh tells Moses' sister, who happens to be watching to make sure her baby brother ends up somewhere safe, 
that she wants to adopt the baby and the sister should go find a wet nurse for the baby. So the sister runs and gets their mother. I know, so clever. <laughs> so Moses grows up being cared for by his own mother, who is even paid by the Pharaoh's daughter to take care of him. Once Moses is grown up and married, he is keeping watch over his father-in-law's sheep in the hills when he has that encounter with the burning bush. And according to the text, the voice of God says to Moses, I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come to rescue them from the hand of their enslavers, and I will bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I will bring them to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites. So go now to bring my people out of Egypt. So just this part of the story tells us so much about those who are writing it down centuries later. First, that they're claiming a God who cares about their suffering and will intervene on their behalf, but it also tells us that the promised land was not unoccupied. Other people were already living there in that land of milk and honey, a whole list of other people, which is where the bitter and violent conflict unfolding even today goes back to thousands of years old stories about the origins of peoples, how they understand themselves and where they belong in this world. As the Exodus story continues, God definitely intervenes and sends 10 increasing, increasingly horrible plagues on the Egyptians, things like boils and lice and locusts and raging storms. And after each plague, Pharaoh relents in the face of this new strange and horrible thing befalling his people and tells Moses he'll let the people go, but then changes his mind. And then comes the last and the most awful, the death of every firstborn male child in the land. But before God sends this one, God warns the Israelites it's coming and instructs them through Moses to kill lambs, paint the blood of the lambs on their doorposts that the angel of death will know to pass over and spare those houses. God commands the Israelites to eat that lamb with bitter herbs and bread made without leaven and to eat standing up so they'll be ready to run. The story says it all came to pass. Pharaoh was so overcome with grief at the loss of so many firstborn children, including his own, that he commands Moses to take his people and get out of the country. But even then he changed his mind. And he went with his soldiers to follow them and try to recapture them. And the army overtakes them as the Israelites are camped at the edge of the Red Sea. And the people are, of course, terrified. Water in front of them, soldiers behind them. But the story says God tells Moses to stretch his hand out over the water and the water parts and the Israelites walk through on dry ground with a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left. And then Moses stretches his hand out again and the waters return and drown the soldiers. And this is how the Israelites are brought out of Egypt and into freedom. And if you've ever been to a Seder, you know that we, we kind of eat the story. We take it into ourselves, literally. There's horseradish, bitter herbs to taste the bitterness of enslavement. There's haroset, which is apples and honey. 
mixed up together to look like the mortar the Israelites used when they were making the pyramids, but it's sweet so we can taste the sweetness of freedom. One of my favorite parts of the Seder is the 10 plagues. And we remember them by each person taking a drop of wine out of their glass on their, fling, on their finger and dropping it away for each plague, one drop of wine for each plague, either the plagues of old or as we do it here, the plagues of now, the plagues of our own time, racism and poverty and indifference and warfare and selfishness and prejudice and fear. And we take wine out of the cup because we are diminished by the suffering of any human being, including those who have oppressed us. Our joy, our pleasure, our cup is made less full by the suffering of all others. This is one of the essential teachings of the Seder. And another teaching equally essential is that none of us are truly free until all of us are free. As I said last night, it is impossible to talk about Passover this year without acknowledging what's happening in Israel and Gaza. The deep suffering, the suffering of those killed in the attack by Hamas on October 7th, the terror and the suffering of those taken hostage that day, half of whom are not still, are still not free, elders and children among them. And the deep suffering of the people of Gaza because of the brutal retaliatory actions taken by the state of Israel. More than 33,000 people have been killed and over twice that number injured Medical care has been devastated. Almost two million people are displaced and the streets are turned to rubble. And if you look at photographs, you will see that the streets are turned to literal rubble. Our denomination's organizing body, the Unitarian Universalist Association, has been calling for a unilateral ceasefire since October 17th and condemning the acts of the Israeli government in the strongest terms as genocidal acts. And I condemn them too. I condemn them even as an American Jew from as many centuries back as I know, I understand deep in my bones the yearning for a place on this globe where Jews can live free of persecution. But the Seder reminds the Jewish people every year that we have to remember our history, that we have to recall the days of our oppression so that we don't become the oppressors. We have to remember the refugees and the unwelcome strangers we have to remember being refugees and unwelcome strangers in foreign lands so that we do not do the same to others. And this may sound utterly simplistic, but I believe it is possible to feel with, to have compassion for more than one group of people at a time. I believe it is possible to hold the complexity of the moment. I believe I can condemn the humanitarian catastrophe the Israeli government has wrought upon Gaza without being anti-Semitic, though some of my Jewish kin will say that I am. And I also grieve how many across the globe have used this moment to turn back toward this ancient hatred of the Jewish people? At Alan's family Seder on Monday night, 
One of the young adults told me he felt unsafe as a Jewish person on his college campus. And he told me that even as we lit a candle for the suffering of the innocent in Gaza and prayed for peace, our joy is made less by the suffering of others. None of us are truly free until all of us are free. How do we learn this? How do we move even one tiny step closer to that gorgeous dream that Aurora Levin's Morales writes of in her poem, Red Sea, a time when no one will drown in the returning waters, a time beyond winners and losers, a time when we finally understand there is only one human family, and it is all of us. In the words of Reverend Julian Hameka Soto, all of us need all of us to make it. Because it's not just Israel and Gaza, of course. Our own country is bitterly divided. Some would say it is shattered. And many of us are truly afraid that our democracy will not hold through this next election year. Many of us have family members on the other side of that bitter divide. And no matter how much we argue, we cannot find a patch of common ground, or maybe we've stopped speaking at all. We've blocked our high school friends on social media because their postings make our hearts hurt. And hatred has come out of hiding. And we are afraid for how much more hatred may be coming. It's taken me a long time to speak of this because I don't have any simple or easy answers for you. I don't know how we heal, how we come back from this any more than I know how Israel and Gaza will. I only know that I believe in believing that we can. I only know that it matters what we hold on to, how we choose to live day by day, sometimes hour by hour, and that we live with as much compassion as we can possibly muster. I know that it matters that we believe that we are all refugees and all prophets and that the sea will only part if we carry each other. I know it matters that we choose again and again to go together. Because the promised land is not a place. It is a way of going. And together is the only way we can go.